but don't bring Joel in. All right. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Reformers broadcast. I'm so glad you've joined us. If you are watching, you're probably watching from History Maker Society fan page or maybe my personal page. Just click share. Share this thing because people are going to want to hear this and see this today. You know what? It's so important to hit share because you don't know. You're ministering to other people. Other people who you had no idea that God needed them to hear something, they're able to hear it when you click share. So spread the word. There's nothing crazy on here. No no scare in the share. <laughs> no scare in the share. So click share. And uh, this is just so awesome to have you. Welcome to the History Makers, well, the Reformers broadcast. <laughs> so I'm going to be hosting today. We have a special guest. And just put in the comment section, right, where are you watching from? You know, just <clears throat> your name will come up and then just put your city or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> we're just so excited because we, we have a very special guest, attorney Joel Thornton, international human rights attorney and a good friend of mine. I'll be introducing him more uh, properly in the next few moments, but I want to give a big announcement. I, meant, I mentioned this on our Miracle Monday broadcast, that the History Makers experience, I mean, people ask me all the time about the History Makers experience, when is it going to happen online? We were really delayed in that because we we're traveling the world, holding live trainings, different churches, different countries, seeing transformation begin in the nations of the world through this incredible three and a half day intensive, specially choreographed uh, equipping system. That's what we call it. You know, imagine just three and a half days can change your life. That's where those testimonies are coming from. It's so powerful. The things that people do after they've taken the history makers experience. So what did we do? We have brought it online during the crisis. The crisis brought the solution. The crisis allowed us to be able to focus on bringing this incredible, life-changing experience online. It's a two and a half day, 16 hours <laughs> of intensive training and equipping in your calling purpose and in reformation and transformation. I mean, it's hard to even describe what this thing is. It's so good. And uh, so we've got one coming up. The online one, people are writing saying, when is History Makers Experience online? When is the next one? It is September 24th to 26th. If you go to the body of this, uh, this post and click more, you'll see in the text area there, there's a link that will take you to more information, September 24th to 26th. This thing will change your life. The stories are true. The results are true. It works. You know, in this day and age, we're we're so inundated with the prophetic and what might be coming later and what might happen, might not happen. This thing is is one plus two, you know, equals three. <laughs> one, one plus one equals two. And that's exactly what you're going to find out. This thing works. It is the ultimate result-oriented machine. Why not invest in yourself? I mean, two and a half days for intensive training that's going to open what we call a destiny doorway for you to walk through into your purpose and calling or to enhance what you're already doing. There's supernatural impartation. I mean, one of the best ways we've described this thing is a specially choreographed environment designed and spirit-filled environment designed to bring you to the end of your own abilities where you must step into God's ability to complete the training. How does that sound? <laughs> this thing is real. So we are so excited for you to join us September 24th to 26th. Register in that link there in the body of the text. I know my wife has thrown it up there. You can see it uh, below the screen, but also if you want to click on it, it's up above in the, in the actual body. We see Jude is watching. Hello from Toronto. Welcome, Jude. We've got some great things to do here. So without... Without more delay, I'm going to bring somebody on. And uh, Joel Thornton, let me tell you about Joel Thornton. We had a very unlikely uh, meeting. In fact, let's bring him on right now. Let's bring on Joel Thornton. I want to introduce him with him with him on. We got the History Maker Society mug going on. Make history, make history makers. 
Okay, let me give a good introduction to this guy right here. <clears throat> now, Joel Thornton, we were speaking. I He was a speaker at a conference in, was it Omaha, Nebraska, Joel? Omaha, yeah. Nebraska, yes. Omaha, sir. Nebraska. <clears throat> and I was a speaker as well, and we were in the back room. Everybody was eating lunch, and, and by the time everybody cleared out of the room, it was just Joel and I, and we talked each other's ear off. I think we talked for like four hours and you know that turned into a great friendship because he's such a man of depth uh a man of brilliance and intelligence but also a man of mercy and you're gonna you're gonna hear about some of that today uh i want to boast about him a little bit of course he's international human rights attorney he's going to talk a little bit about that he's an author of uh, multiple books i believe um he's worked with some of the greats maybe you've You've heard some of their names, but I'll leave that up to him, whether he wants to share that information. And uh, <clears throat> as well, he's also the uh, president of P33, uh, P33 Tours, which is a joint venture between History Maker Society. And uh, we've got a trip. Where do we tour? We tour in Greece. We, to we take people on tours to Israel. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So without further ado, Joel Thornton, welcome to the broadcast. Do we have a clap button on here? I really am dying to use this clap button. No, I don't I don't know if it worked. Joel, welcome to the broadcast. Hey. Wow, well, thanks, Derek. What a welcome. I got a rooster crowing in the background and people clapping. You never know what's gonna happen in the Philippines, Joel. No, it, God bless the Philippines. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, let's just get into this right now quickly with the Israel trip. I'm so excited. Yeah. Talk a little about talk a little bit about that. This give us the details. Well, you know, Derek, you and I started this this company with a tour of Israel back in 2017, and uh, and we're doing our second tour with you. It'll be by the time we get to this tour, it'll be my seventh tour of Israel. And wow. I'm I'm, ex wow. I'm excited about this tour though because. We're, we're doing two things. You can, if you want to just come on the tour, you can come on a tour following the steps of Jesus, go to the Sea of Galilee, go to the Dead Sea, spend a lot of time in Jerusalem, walking where Jesus walked, or on the Via Della Rosa, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Garden Tomb, all of those places, everything you've heard about your whole life. You stand on the Mount of Olives and look out over the, the city of, Israel, of, of Jerusalem. Uh, you'll go down in the Kidron Valley and actually walk through the Garden of Gethsemane you can walk in, touch the olive trees. We, we'll spend some time praying there, talking about what happened. Uh, and if you want to just do the tour, you can do that. That's uh, going to be the 6th of August through the 13th of August next year. And the cost of that, the cost of that total from, from Canada is $35.99. If you want to come uh, and just participate in the ground portion uh, the price is going to be uh, out of the Philippines. It's eighteen hundred and ninety dollars, uh, and these Not are all bad. U.S. dollars. Yeah. Th these are all U.S. dollars. People need to remember that uh, because everything we purchase, I have to purchase in U.S. dollars. Even though Israel is on the shekel, when we make our purchases in Israel, we actually purchase with dollars uh, and not with shekels. So, and the airlines are the same way. Uh, even if we pur <coughs> purchase <coughs> trips just from from Canada, we purchase them in dollars. You know, I'm really excited, Joel, because we're going to take a lot of people from the Philippines as well. They'll be meeting us over there. Speaking of the Philippines, mm -hmm. I see Ati Jem is watching. Greetings, Ati Jem. Just if you've come on, share the broadcast, share where you're watching from. Joel, this Israel tour, I mean, the last time we went, uh, you and I, my father was there. This was a really powerful tour. And what I liked was, um, you know, the hotels were, were nice. Where we were staying, it was, you know, yeah. for a good it was quality. This was a great tour. Yeah, these are what I would classify as four-star hotels. You know, the the prices include uh, all of the all of your breakfast, which is a buffet breakfast at every hotel, bu buffet dinners. It includes basically everything except your lunch on a daily basis, which you can eat or not eat. And a lot of people chose not to eat lunch on the tour. They just would carry some snacks with them and maybe have some nuts or a piece of fruit or something. And then it doesn't include water, souvenirs, things like that. But everything else is included from the time you land in Israel to the time you come home, including all tips, everything like that. So it, it is a really nice tour. And, and Derek, you know, because you've been there a couple of times, uh, Israel is like no other place on the planet. Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, you and I have traveled all over the world. And, and the first time when we went to Israel, it was the first time I'd been. It was your second time, I think. And we had... 
you know, I'd had people tell me, oh, when you go to Israel, it's just amazing. You won't believe it. It'll change your world. It'll rock your world. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been all over the world and I love where, everywhere I go, but I don't think this will be anything special. And then we show up in Israel and God met us in Israel. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. every time I've been there, that's the, the thing is you just feel you can feel the presence of God in Israel like you feel it nowhere else in the world. Even with all the turmoil that's going on in the Middle East, you feel the presence of God there. And it's amazing. It's, you know, you, you're so right about that. It was actually my fourth time, Joel, going. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and every time it's the same. It's the, it's the same thing in the sense of what you're talking about. You almost feel like you, I know you haven't, but you almost feel like you've been there before or it's home to you in some way. Like there's, there is something spiritual there. I, before, I thought it was all hype. You know, people are just right. excited. They're seeing what they've read about in the Bible. But honestly, you feel something there. And when you when you go to the garden tomb, even though there's debate over where Jesus's actual tomb was, it's hard to miss the big rocky skull cliffside that <laughs> looks like Golgotha, that looks like right. the place of the skull. And there's the tomb. But for me, I could feel the presence of the Lord. I could feel something genuinely. Yeah, it's it's amazing when you're in the garden tomb and. And I'm with you. I, I go back and forth on whether I believe it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Garden Tomb. But uh, the one thing I don't go back and forth on is I feel the presence of God in the Garden Tomb. And that's mm. that's typically where we end most of the tours because it's a really nice, solemn way to end the tour. And you get a good just a you can kind of sit back and relax for a few minutes. We take communion there and we spend a little bit of time sharing in the word. You'll be sharing some from there. Uh, pulling something out of the scriptures and talking about when Jesus rose from the tomb, then you can walk in the tomb and it's just, it's an enclave that's sitting just outside the, what's now the old city walls. And it's, it's literally, you feel like you're in a, you feel like you've gone back in time because it's quiet. Uh, there's a, literally a garden there. There are places where you can sit and reflect. And it's just an amazing thing to do. That's awesome. You know, Joel, uh, we, we've got that right up on the screen there. You can see that. I love that. Thank you, Sarah. History Maker Society, Steps of Jesus Tour. I'll actually be going. I'm not just saying you should go. We'll be going together. We'll be on the bus together. We'll be experiencing it together. So join myself, Joel Thornton, our, our whole team uh, who works on that in Israel. August, uh, you'll be able to click the go to P33 Adventures. All the details are there. You'll see that. Yeah. Now, Joel, we'll the History Maker Society tours. So. Yeah, History Maker Society tours. Joel, there's a lot happening in the world right now. And you are one guy I love to talk to. You're not only the chair of our board, uh, but you're just somebody that's enjoyable to talk to. So you got to deliver today for us. Is that okay? Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll try to live up to the hype. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, t tell us about international human rights, some of what you've done. Uh, give us a bit of resume uh, on yourself as it pertains to your human rights advocacy and all of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Derek. You know, I, I became a lawyer about 27 years ago. Um, never wanted to be a lawyer. Didn't didn't grow up with the ambition of, man, if I could just be a lawyer. I thought their jobs were boring and dull. And, wow. and, and in fact, for the most part, they can be. Most lawyers are, are very boring and dull. And um, But I, I went to law school because I felt like the Lord told me to go. And while I was in law school, um, I was hired by Jay Sekulow uh, to work with him at his organization, his ministry. And that began a 15-year journey where I spent uh, time with Jay Sekulow, helping him prepare for Supreme Court cases, helping him uh, handle cases uh, over Operation Rescue out in, out in Wichita in the, in the summer of, of mercy when they were out there blockading uh, George Tiller's clinic that was performing abortions up to birth. They were literally performing abortions up to the day of birth, and they blockaded the clinic, and we were in federal court trying to keep everybody out of jail. Um, we we did that for years. I worked on Bible club cases all across America. I helped start Bible clubs by working with youth pastors and kids and their parents and, and the schools, and we sued schools over not allowing Bible clubs on campus. Did all of those things, uh, and it was just it was a very heady, fun time. But as we as we got through the 90s and, and really around 1998, 99, we started, um, I started really feeling like we needed to expand into Europe. And so I talked to Jay about it and I convinced him that we needed to open the doors in Europe and to, and to bring human rights 
legal work to Europe the same way we were doing it in America. And so went over and did a, a trip to uh, to France, Germany, and England, and to uh, and also to uh, the net or to Belgium. And we we looked at it, found some cases going on there, and came back and started a, an organization there called the European Center for Law and Justice. And I did that for a few years, and we handled cases at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France, which is the equivalent of the Supreme Court of the United States, and uh, handled cases involving homeschool students. We handled cases, uh, one of the, the biggest cases we handled there was a, a case out of Russia uh, where the Russian government had, re- or the Moscow, the government of Moscow had refused to recognize as a, as a legitimate religious organization the um, Salvation Army because they, <laughs> they, they classified the Salvation Army as a paramilitary group. Wow. Because, because they were called an army. They yeah. had army yeah. ranks because, you know, you're a captain in the army, you're a colonel in the army. Uh, and because they, they wore uniforms, the Moscow government refused to recognize them. And uh, I worked on the case with our, with our attorneys from Moscow. There were a couple of Russian guys that were our tremendous attorneys. I worked with them. We brought the case in at Strasbourg to the European Court of Human Rights and ultimately won that case where the European wow. court said, wow. This is a religious organization, and you have to recognize it. And by recognizing it, it's something that's not common to Westerners. So Canadians wouldn't understand this. Americans wouldn't understand it. But if you're not recognized, it doesn't just mean that you don't get a tax exemption. It means that you can't legally perform weddings. You can't legally perform funerals. You can't rent uh, facilities. So if you're the Salvation Army and you want to host an event at a local, uh, you want to rent like a local town hall to have an event, you can't do it because you're not legally recognized and you don't have any authority to rent it. So you can't actually have a public gathering. And it, so wow. there was a lot of issues wow. with it, but we were able to get that done. Uh, then uh, I'm, I lived in France for about a year with my family uh, in 2001. In fact, we were there on September 11th, 2001, uh, which was just an absolute chaotic time. I mean, it was, there were, there were people Chant, driving down the street, young, young Middle Eastern Arabs who Muslim kids who lived in France would literally sit in the windows of their cars. And Europe, the car windows even in the back roll all the way down, and they would literally be sitting in the doorways of their car, banging on the roofs of their car, and, and all three doors, but the driver chanting "Death to America, Death to Israel." Wow! In right, France, right after the right after the towers came down, I mean, within a day. And um, wow. and they, wow. it was just it was just crazy. My wife, who's who's one hundred percent Lebanese, was um, by birth, uh, by genetics, her grandparents came to America from Lebanon, so second generation American born Lebanese. But she looks like somebody who was born in Beirut because mm-hmm. she's got she's full blooded mm-hmm. Lebanese. There were one night right after that we had some. She was out walking our dogs at about eight or nine o'clock at night. It was dark, and she had some some Muslim boys came by and started cursing her in Arabic because she was dressed like a Westerner and she didn't have on a hijab, mm. which she doesn't mm-hmm. wear because she's a Christian. Yeah, and so, so we got out of there and came home. And, uh, and over the next couple of years, I really felt called to Europe. So I ended up leaving working with Jay in 2004 and started the International Human Rights Group and began to concentrate on doing human rights work in Europe. And one of the cases I had there, there was a, an American pastor who was arrested at a big public gathering for leafleting on a sidewalk at a parade on their Independence Day. And, I, and this is a, one of the most interesting things I think that's ever happened to me. I don't know if anybody else has done this, any other lawyer. I, I actually handled a case at the trial court in Norway, handled a trial in front of a three-judge panel. Uh, called witnesses, cross-examined witnesses, presented evidence, just like you would in any trial you'd see on television in Norway, in English. Uh, they hired a translator to work with me, cross-examined police officers, uh, and and went through the whole nine yards and, and was able to handle a, a case actually in Norway. So, you know, it's it's been quite an experience, but they have the same issues in Europe we have here. They, they arrest people on the street for exercising their First Amendment freedoms. Uh, you know, there there's a lot of one of the bigger things that's going on in Europe that doesn't happen in the West, in the West, Western hemisphere as much is they're arresting people for reading Bible verses that include the references to homosexuality in a negative light. 
They're being arrested. I, I talked to a guy who was arrested at Wimbledon a, a few, three or four years ago. He was merely reading the scripture where Paul gives a litany of things that you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven yeah, if you do yeah, these yeah. things. And one of them was homosexuality. When he got to the word homosexuality, the police handcuffed him and led him away. Wow. And and so yeah. Europe is tightening down on a lot of that stuff quicker than America has because we've got a little bit purer understanding of free speech because of the First Amendment. The, the idea of free speech is is protected in Europe just like it is here, but it's not quite as sacrosanct as it is in America. And you know from dealing with Americans, Americans understand their rights and demand their rights all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel, talk a little bit. What about sex trafficking? This is a hot topic. Have you done anything related to that? Any advocacy for that? Sex trafficking. I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. That wasn't what you were looking for, was it? <laughs> you know, no, definitely I, not. About um about 12 years ago, I started I started looking at sex trafficking and, and going, there's this is just twisted and dark. I went to my wife and oh. I said, we need to pray about this because I feel like I need to get engaged in the sex trafficking business. And I was I was still doing the International Human Rights Group. I, I hadn't I, I went and did some other things not long after this, but I and I, I told her I just I don't know, but I just feel like I need to be doing some things in Eastern Europe because this is one of the places where where a lot of this is coming out of. And the trouble is, if we go into Eastern Europe, we've got to. I've, I think I literally have to be worried about my physical safety because you're going to be taking on, you know, mafia. You're going to be taking on organized crime. And so I said, we need to pray about this because I, I I don't I don't want to put our family at risk and put myself at risk and take me from the family uh, over this in just a flippant way. So let's pray about it. So we began praying about it. And God began opening up doors for me uh, to look at things in the United States. And so a, a couple of years after I started praying those prayers and really engaging on how do I get engaged in this on a on a, any kind of level at all, I started working for the Department of Education in Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, which oversees the education of about 1.9 million mm -hmm. uh, public school students. And I was the chief of staff for the state school superintendent. And I started talking to him about trafficking. And I said, why don't we host a human trafficking conference? And so we brought in some of the people. We brought in the guys that founded the Scotland Yard human trafficking team. We brought in people that had worked at the UN on human trafficking. We brought in one of the ladies who investigated some of the um, some of the killing that went on in, in Bosnia and Serbia during that war. And she literally was an on-the-ground investigator looking at all of the human rights violations that went on and um, and put, and hosted conferences that began to teach uh, kids and teachers and counselors how to spot someone who's who's trying to traffic you, how to avoid being trafficked, how to f spot someone who has been trafficked. Because surprisingly enough, a lot of these kids that are trafficked still go to school. They'll be, they, you know, we, when we think of trafficking, we, we tend to think that it involves you moving from one place to another because of the word trafficking. Trafficking yeah. is a, is a yeah. word of motion, uh, but you can be trafficked and never, never leave your house. Uh, you can be trafficked. It's not, it's not, doesn't matter that you've been moved from one place to another when you've been trafficked. It matters whether there's been force coercion or fear involved in getting you to do something you didn't want to do. And in this case, it's having sex. And so, you know, there, just for an example, in the United States, they estimate about, uh, that there's as many as 15,000 kids a year that are trafficked in the in the United States. In Georgia, they believe that it's about 400 kids a month, mostly girls, some boys now. It's starting to be boys a little more. Uh, but 400 girls a month, which is almost 5,000 children a year, are trafficked out of the state of Georgia alone. <clears throat> now, some of those are, are moved to other locations. Some of them are left in the states. And so one of the first things you have to do with trafficking is we have to get the word out. I mean, everybody hears about it. They hear talking about it, but we've got to educate people on what to look for. How do you, how yeah. can you yeah. changes in your child that maybe indicate that there's something going on that's not right? Uh, because, and you know this, Derek, as a pastor and as a minister of the gospel, you know that people who are, who are dealing in sexual sin, there, there are subtle changes that you can tell in their behaviors that will let, let you see what's going on, even if you don't know what's going on. Yeah. And particularly yeah. in something like this, because when we're talking about girls that are trafficked, sometimes we're talking 
that they may service 20 to 30 men a night. Wow. Wow. And, and you don't do that kind of thing as a, as a young person and not have some serious effects from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Joel, you know, there, there, there's sort of this, and we're just working on this uh, echo here. Our, our apologies. I don't have the headset today. Um, you know, this, this is amazing to me. Um, watching the Jeffrey Epstein documentary and how this whole now. thing is shaking down, that really gave insight to me into how the thing works, how people are getting away with it. Because you wonder why, you know, things aren't stopped and you find out you've got all kinds of people on all different levels actually involved in it. Uh, what's happening with this Epstein thing? Is this God shaking a, a, like I, you remember I heard that, that uh, the man say, you know, we tripped over a large structure that was established yeah. in the U S or, or, you know, speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I, I just started watching the Epstein thing yesterday. I've been flipping oh, through okay. it and going, I've been looking at it going, I need to look at that. But, uh, but I, I just kind of, I don't know, but I've, I've, I'm on episode three right now. And, but I've been following the Epstein story because it, it's an absolutely uh, fascinating story. You know, a lot of people are going, well, we need to get to the bottom of Epstein and won't this be great? Let's find out what's going on. And I keep cautioning people uh, mm. just saying, look, you need to be careful what you wish for, because this is not going to be the people you hate that turn up in Epstein. This is going to be people you love turning up in Epstein. It's wow. everybody. And that's part of the problem with it. One of the things that is the message of Jeffrey Epstein is how deep this thing goes into our politics, into our, into our, into Hollywood, into the music industry, all of those things. It's just, it's everybody has been on that plane and been out to pedophile Island. And wow. I, you know, and that's part of the reason that it's, that it's been so slow. Everything's been so slow coming out. You know, there's some, things starting to leak out to the press now. And the New York Post has been doing a pretty good job of covering all this. And it's coming out of a trial in, in Australia with a girl down there who was a victim who brought a civil claim down there. And there's been a lot of depositions. I think uh, Gillan Maxwell gave a deposition down there. And a lot of that stuff's coming out. That's where the, the photo of Bill Clinton with the two young girls, the 12 or 14 year old girls came from. Uh, and so all of that's coming out of that trial. I think it will ultimately leak out, but there are a lot of people in Washington, D.C. that do not want this to be made public. And that's the problem with human trafficking is because it's sex, you know, it's people are just people can be perverted. And and because it's sex, people can get trapped into this that are that are normal, nice people, seemingly to get in the middle of this. And then suddenly it's not quite as exciting to bring down normal, nice people. It's really nice if you're, if you're rescuing girls and if you're, if you're getting rid of dirty old men and things like that. But when you're looking at a 20 or a 30 year old man, who seems fairly normal, except for the fact that he's participating in this illegal prostitution, it, it's, it's a more difficult thing. And that's part of the problem. Plus it's organized crime. And who wants to really take organized crime on at its head? And, and beyond that, Derek, as you know, is the spiritual dimension of this whole thing. That's right. That's right. The principalities and the powers that control this are ancient. I mean, these are these yeah. are these are demonic principles that have been around uh, since the foundation of the earth, and have had yeah. have vast powers. You know that that are the the god Moloch in ancient times, where they sacrificed babies to this god. That's the same kind of spiritual dimension that you're dealing with now. And, and so it's, it's, really, it's really tough, but it's hard to look at, too, because the, when you see these, these innocent kids, you know, most people don't know this. The average age that someone gets involved in sex trafficking is 14. Wow. 14 years of age. That seems too young children, to, children. to be trapped in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Joel, you know, there are people who, you know, they get to the conference, they get excited about doing something for Jesus, and they're passionate about seeing people set free from, you know, being trafficked prisoners, literally sex slaves. And they, they want to jump in as the church and meet that need. Would you speak to that a bit? Is that wise to do? Or do, do we have ways that we should be doing that? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I think, uh, first of all, everybody needs to be engaged in this. 
And the first okay. thing that needs to be done is, is there needs to be prayer involved. Everybody needs to be praying. I'm working on right now. And I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this. I'm working on putting together a team of intercessors that literally ultimately will pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week about nothing but human trafficking and breaking the strongholds that are human trafficking. Wow. How can somebody get involved in that? Well, they, they can contact me by, um, by contacting me at the email address, uh, joel at ihrg.org. If y'all want to throw that up on the screen at some point, um, they can contact me there. And I've just started talking to a group of pastors about putting this together and, and so we're going to have someone that's dedicated to putting that together, to organizing the prayer. It won't be me. I mean, that's that's not my job. I'll be praying with them from time to time, but but it's not me that's going to that's going to organize that. But that's the first thing we've got to do. You need to look around. There there are organizations everywhere that are working on this. Basically, almost every town now, every city certainly has a human trafficking task force. Every state has one. Most states have one. There are organizations that are doing work in slavery, uh, Tennessee, in slavery, Georgia, A21 campaign. The Polaris Project is doing this on a national level. You've got groups out there that are doing great work that you can come alongside of. The first thing they need to do, though, is start getting educated on what the issue is, because, uh, you know, everybody thinks, well, I want to go out and rescue these girls because this is horrible. But the trouble with rescuing girls as a civilian is you end up messing up the criminal case against the traffickers. So because there's already you know, investigation going on. There's already somebody's working. Right. On it. Yeah. right. There's a guy in Atlanta that that does is a private eye and he does investigations and, and takes pictures and gets recordings and does everything he can. And then he turns them over to the police. But the police are frustrated with it because it doesn't have the right chain of evidence going on to actually prosecute these people. It has wow. to be official wow. investigations by the police. Uh, but there's there's all kind of organizations that are providing housing. You know, we've got an organization here in, in Rome, Georgia, called In Slavery Georgia. And what they're doing is they they built a house uh, with a couple of private bedrooms and they're adding on to it all the time where they're literally taking girls who have been sex trafficked and bringing them in and trying to restore them and take them through a, a rehabilitation process. Teach them how to dress, teach them how to act, teach them table manners. I mean, you don't think about that, but if you're taken at 14 years older, you know, the average age is 14, which means there are girls younger than that that are being taken. If you're being taken at those ages, you're not getting some of the training that we all take for granted, like how to hold your fork and knife and, and those kind of things, how to eat, how to bathe properly, all of those things. And then there's also all of the psychological issues. I mean, this is not something you don't, if you get rescued out of human trafficking and you've been, you've been a sex slave, you're not, you're not going back to a normal life anytime soon. There's, you're looking at years and a lifetime of counseling and, and deliverance and prayer and everything else that goes into that to get back to any semblance of normal. So they, the first thing they do is find somebody close to them that's working on it, close to them in a the, in physical location that's working on it and see what they need for volunteers. Because, you know, I, I serve on a, on the board of another ministry that, that is fighting human trafficking. They've moved to Thailand and opened up uh, education centers and daycare and, and uh, childcare centers there because they went to they went to Pattaya, Thailand, which is ground zero for human trafficking internationally, and said, we're going to stop human trafficking by getting kids out of the flow on the front end, by educating them, giving them hope, giving them something that they can, that they can look forward to, a life that they can look forward to, rather than getting into despair and giving in to this and save these kids from even getting in. Because imagine that if we can keep kids from getting into human trafficking, we're so much better off because then we don't have to go through the years of trouble to overcome all the issues that you've dealt with. Wow. That's oh, awesome, that's Joel. Awesome. You know what? I want to circle back on this in a moment, ask you a little more personal question. Uh, but first of all, just if you've joined in, if you if you're watching this, maybe you're watching this later you know many of our viewers they jump on later on and they watch what was done and just click share share the broadcast uh like history maker society we're really wanting to build up that page just click like there we just want to welcome you to the broadcast if you if you've just joined as well the history makers experience is now online september 24th to 26th and uh click the link there in the body 
text area of this actual post, and you'll be able to get more information on that. That thing is mind blowing, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But, but Joel, I, I want you to speak a little bit to you know you mentioned that you felt that God called you into this, and one thing I noticed about you, and it's not the lawyer in you, but you've got some fight in you, and you're a spiritual man, godly man. You know, I, I call you behind your back a big teddy bear, uh, but you know how to you know how to fight. You know how to fight mm-hmm. for something. I'm not talking physically fight but you've right. got something that is god given and, and without i hope this isn't controversial but i see it in trump president trump I, I have an understanding of why god chooses some of the people he does and mm-hmm. uh and so can you speak to that a little bit is there is the church are we to be on the front lines of the fight so to speak what does someone need to go into <laughs> politics or to fight injustices is that something you're born with it can be developed you know address that a little bit yeah absolutely Derek. that's a, that's a the great church question be fighting is my point <laughs> yeah you know derek if the church isn't fighting the church isn't the church it is my attitude you know if you want to be the church the church is the hands and feet of jesus it's the expression of jesus on the planet and the one thing we know about jesus is whatever you do to the least of these you've done to me period you want to know how you how you rank with Jesus? What'd you do with the prisoners? What'd you do with the hungry person you saw? What did you do with the with the with the orphans and the widows? All of those things, uh, you know. What did you do to a naked person that you saw, a crazy person on the street? How did you deal with that? And I'm not saying that you have to stop and deal with each of those because I don't. I don't. Every time I see a hungry person on the street, I don't stop and do something. But what are you doing to help in those realms? And, and that's where the church is, has lost its vision in a lot of ways, and it's starting to get it back. And that's one of the things I love about History Makers Academy and History Makers Society is, you know, up until 20 years ago or, or so, you, you, if you were called into the ministry, you were going to be a pastor yeah. or you were going to be an evangelist or you're going to be a teacher. And now one of the things that, that, you've, that you're really leading the charge on, I brag about you all over the world, Derek, one of the uh, things that you're yeah. really leading the, the culture in is this idea that you can be called to the ministry and never do any ministry activity as far as what looks like ministry activity. I don't ever participate in an altar call. I don't ever end up anything with going, hey, there may be somebody here that needs to know Jesus. My attitude is if you didn't see enough Jesus in me to want Jesus, then I didn't do my job. Mm-hmm. And I don't. you don't have to give an altar call to that if you're out living it. Now, as far as the fight, I'm a justice person. And my wife is just walked through the room here and she's going to hear me say this, and she's going to probably start laughing. Uh, I, if you're looking for mercy, you don't need to place a phone call to Joel Thornton. She just said, "Amen." You couldn't hear. Uh, if you if you if you're looking for mercy, you need to call Angel Thornton, my wife. Uh, hey, she can, greetings she to Angel, who just walked in the room. We don't know how you put up with Joel, but <laughs> good to see you. Good to know you're there, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she's a, she's a saint. There's no question about it. She didn't have to die and do three miracles. She went straight to sainthood. But but there's a so it, I, I, but I'm motivated by justice. I hate to see people harmed, and and it, it just it, it's it's part of the core of who I am. It's always been the core of who I am. When I was a young man, I would see people in a, in a cultural sense. I really identified with the African-American people in America because they were so oppressed that I just the sense of justice in me made me wish I was African-American so I could experience that injustice and get righteously indignant about it. And and part of what God has called us to as a church is to righteous indignation, not just over things that are affecting us, but things that are affecting his people all over the place. And so that some of that's inborn, but you can also learn it. Look, I, I, I'll tell you a great story about learning, uh, learning confrontation. Cause I was, I was a people pleaser for a long time, hated to, you know, in law school, I didn't want to raise my hand and answer a question. I did everything I could to avoid getting called on. Cause I just, I just wanted to be there. Cause as you know, I'm a fairly introverted person in a interpersonal relationship. If, if you put me in a room with people, I don't know, I'll end the night, not knowing anybody in the room. Now, if you put me in a room of people, I know I'll end the night entertaining the room. But yeah. but I'm not yeah. I'm not the type of person that makes friends quickly. Uh, but I learned how to confront people. I was literally 
uh, flying with Jay Sekulow, we would always buy our tickets at the last minute. These were in the days when you literally walked up and walked on the plane. You never went through a security. Yeah. You never checked a bag. Nothing went through. You just walked up, handed your ticket to the guy and got on the plane. Great, glorious days of aviation. We would be flying first class and we would be literally getting on the plane five minutes before they're, they're pushing back. Now you can't even do it. 15 minutes before they don't let you on. Uh, but at this point, they would, not, at this point, they would let you on. So we get there one day, five minutes till, and we walk up and hand them our tickets. And the lady goes, I'm sorry, uh, your seats are taken. And I said, what do you mean our seats are taken? We have tickets right here that say we're in these seats. We want our seats. And she goes, well, sir, uh, your seats have been taken. I said, well, then we don't have a reservation. And she goes, no, no, you have a reservation. I said, well, good. Then we'll take our reservation because Jay's going, Joel, get us on the plane. Here's your, here's your here's your lesson in confrontation. I, I'm not I've, I've got to be on this plane. Get me on the plane. And so I argued with the lady for about 30 minutes and or 10 minutes. And she finally gives in and realizes I'm not going to leave and, and puts us on the plane and goes in and takes two people out of first class and moves them back into coach and puts us down. And as we get ready to sit down, our seats aren't together. Now, this is back in the days when you paid for first class before everybody that was in there was in, on an upgrade. And um and so people had some skin in the game. Well, these are and these are all businessmen because this was a flight from Atlanta to, to Washington D.C. Oh, and they've wow. got all their, they've got all their their tray tables are down. They've got file folders out. They've got stuff everywhere, and they're sitting there. And I'm going up to him, going, "Excuse me, sir, do you mind uh, swapping seats with me? I need to sit next to my boss." Because he stood over there, crossed his arms, and said, "I am not sitting down until you have us sitting together." Welcome to confrontation training, Joel. Literally, he said that to me out loud, and um, and the lady, he the said, stewardess, well, he said, "Welcome to confrontation training, Joel." Yes, yes. <laughs> and the the stewardess is now going, "Sir, y'all need to sit down. We can't move the plane until y'all sit down, and we're late, and y'all need to sit down." And and Jay's Jay's standing there like with his arms crossed like this. We're both in suits, and we've got briefcases with us. And he's going, "Joel, I'm not sitting until I'm sitting next to you." And so I start asking people. That are that are very comfortable. They have they all have drinks and they're serving them in glass at this time because these were the glory days of flying. So they're all sitting there with their gin and tonics or their whiskey and coke and and and, and just enjoying themselves. And I'm going up to everybody, going, "I'm sorry, I need you to move. It, would you mind swapping seats with me? Look, I'm in that seat right over there. It's just as nice as your seat. Do you mind moving? I need to sit next to my boss. He's sitting next to you. And they're, they're just everybody's just telling me, "No, I can't get anybody to move." And finally, one guy goes do you really want to sit next to your boss? And I, I looked at him and, and Jay's standing right there. And I said, no, sir, I, I actually don't. What I really want to do is go sit in the last seat on this plane in coach and enjoy my trip to Washington, D.C. Because when you let me have this seat, I'm going to sit down beside my boss and he's going to give me four pages of notes of things that I have to do in the three hours we're on the ground in Washington, D.C. And I would much rather go sit back there and get a Diet Coke and just have some peanuts just and, relax, and sleep. And the guy goes, you know what, buddy? I'll tell you what, I'm going to do you a favor. You can have this seat. And he gets <laughs> up and we sit down. So so some of this I didn't come by naturally. I was forced into it. But but so it for, is. For some, for some who don't know, tell us who Jay Sekulow is. I mean, I know who he is. A lot of people would, but some people actually don't. Who's Jay Sekulow? Well, Jay Sekulow is an attorney that's argued before the Supreme Court of the United States 12 times. Uh, he's handled, a, he's handled, I think, one case. He's handled a couple of cases at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which is in, uh, in near Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. Uh, he's, uh, he worked for Pat Robertson for years. He was Pat Robertson's lawyer. He runs the American Center for Law and Justice, has a daily radio and television program or daily radio program, a weekly television program on TBN, I think it used to be. I think it may just run on the internet now. And um, and he's also currently one of Donald Trump's attorneys. He handled the impeachment, uh, all of the impeachment hearings for Donald Trump. And if you if you watched any of that when they had Trump's attorneys stand up, Jay spent a lot of time standing up and talking. So he's one of the most prominent lawyers in America. And this was before he was quite that famous. When I first started working for him, I didn't I didn't really know who he was. I'd read a magazine interview with him and I thought, ah, I'd like to do what that guy's doing. I'll call him. Uh, and he became more famous through television programs on TBN. He's been on all the big news channels. He's written books. He's uh, uh, He just wrote a, a book about Jerusalem, which is a, is a pretty good book uh, that talks about 
the history of Jerusalem and why Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. And so, uh, you know, just a very prominent lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Jo Joel, would you say that God put you there for the purpose of mentoring you? And does God yeah. put people, uh, maybe you're not being mentored by, by the pastor, does he put you in peculiar places, occupations, and around people who can even offend you at times for the purpose of mentoring you? Does God have a mentorship program for reformers? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, Derek. I mean, there's no question about that. Listen, um, I, do I think God put me there? Uh, it was, Jay is such an intense person as a lot of, like Donald Trump is. I mean, you look at Trump and, and, and whether you love Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, the guy sleeps three hours a day and works the other 21. I mean, he's not out playing, even when he's golfing, you know, and they go, oh, he's golfing all the time. He's working. He's got somebody there and he's doing so. I've golfed with Jay where he would, we wouldn't run in the same card and he would ask me 30 or 40 questions in a round of golf. And every one of them were business questions that required me to get on a cell phone and do work while we're golfing. I mean, they, they, these guys work all the time. They're very intense. Jay had a really short fuse and he, and he, used me as his punching bag a lot. And I remember when I was first working there within the first couple of weeks, uh, my, my, I came home and I was, I'd had a really bad day. Jay had just jumped all over me about something and it was really out of line. And at least in my mind, it was, you know, I'm going, ah, that was uncalled for. So I'm at home talking to my dad about it. My dad goes, I'd tell that guy to go straight to Hades. I, I'd be done with him. And I said, dad, you know, I would too, but God told me to work for him. Wow. And so wow. I, I've, I'm staying because this is where God's put me. And the further confirmation of that is uh, by the time I graduated from law school, I was working full time with Jay. And uh, in about about four or five years after I graduated from law school, if you wanted to work for Jay, you had to go through an interview with me to get the job. And they called me Dr. No, uh, because we, we had a very strict uh standard that we were willing to look at in people. And it was not just their legal standard, their legal knowledge. It was also their personality, how we felt about them, how they interacted with us, all of those things. And because it was a Christian organization, it always came back down to faith too, and how your faith was expressed. And, um, and I'm interviewing people one day and we're, you know, we're getting interview, we're getting resumes in from guys that are graduating from Harvard and and from uh, Yale Law Schools and Michigan and, and Chicago Law Schools. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm realizing that I'm interviewing these people and they're trying to get a job with Jay Sekulow. And to get that job, they have to come through me. And if I had sent, if I had sent my resume in that same year, I wouldn't have even been looked at because my law school was so bad compared to them and my, my time in law school because I worked full time. I was working for Jay, I was traveling all over the country with Jay while I was in law school. And, um, and so my grades suffered that I wouldn't have even been able to get an interview with Jay Seculo, much less get a job. I wouldn't have even been past the first hurdle, which is no nope, resume doesn't make it throw that guy out. I would have literally gone out that quickly. And here I was the guy that you have to get through to get the job. And, um, and so, yeah, there was never any question in my mind that God put me there when it came time to go. God spoke to me and said, it's time to go. And it, it was really clear. And, but at the same time, I am who I am as a lawyer because of Jay Sekulow. You know, I've been with him. I stood with him on the 14th Street sidewalk outside the 14th Street abortion clinic in Atlanta when there was a protest going on, a prayer protest going on at the clinic. And the owner of the, of the abortion clinic came out with a camera and walked over to Jay and me and started taking our pictures. And, and just, you know, really trying to intimidate us with police and, and, and called over to Atlanta police officers and said, I want these two guys right here arrested. And Jay's going, you, you can't arrest us. We're attorneys. <laughs> like that was going <laughs> to keep us out of jail. And, uh, and evidently it worked because they never did arrest us. Although they arrested a bunch of people on the sidewalk and we ended up in court over that. But those are, those are those intense moments in life when, when you, you can't be mentored by a pastor at that moment, a mm. pastor couldn't wow. help me at that wow. moment. And, and it took a lawyer like Jay to mentor me and, and teach me to keep my feet on the ground, to keep your wits about you. And, you know, we have a rule when we travel, I've used it with you is no matter what happens, the lawyer doesn't get arrested. Everybody else can get arrested, but the lawyer doesn't get, not that you've ever been threatened with arrest, but you know, when you're out on the streets and you're sharing the gospel and they come up and start threatening to arrest you, 
the, the first rule is get the lawyer out of there because we need him to get everybody out of jail. And, um, and, but you learn that by hanging out with a guy like that. And, and, but because of that, I've also learned because of watching Jay, you know, I've, when I was working with him, I've represented Benny Hinn. I've represented Kenneth Copeland. I've represented Pat Robertson. You know, you can go through a laundry list of people like that, that I've, that I've met. I've, I've met basically everybody. I've represented Paul and Jan Crouch. And, and so I, you know, I've, you just deal with, with such a high echelon that as you're doing mm-hmm. that, uh, you learn how to, how to give people legal advice as a lawyer. You're not always telling them what they want to hear. And that's a hard thing. You know, pastors aren't used to that. They're used to church members that kind of peddle it softly. I know you're not, you're, you're used to people being a lot more honest with you because you invite that honesty. It's part of the history makers Academy and the society kind of understanding of life is that it's not supposed to be a bed of roses. It's supposed to be work. Uh, This is intense. This is, this is heaven or hell. We're talking about this is whether or not a culture is going to return to God or stay with God or fall away from God. And that's what we're in the middle of right now. And the church has has really let down their guard on this, and and now God's raising up people in all kind of different uh, areas and different mountains to take back mountains of influence that we've let go because we just got so busy sitting around being in the church and and kind of enjoying the peace and prosperity of America and of the West, really. And and by the West, I mean the West is any place that's free now. I mean, I, you know. In a lot of ways, the Philippines is the West because there's a, a certain level of freedom that was instituted from Western democracies. It's kind of encapsulated most of the world now uh, at yeah. some level. I mean, yeah. There's a difference yeah. of it, but it's still there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Joel, so, so awesome, especially that mentorship part where you said, you know, it might not be your pastor that mentors you. You know, you might need mentorship from somewhere else. I want you to comment. We don't have a lot of time left. This is so good. Um, and again, if you're joining us on the broadcast, click, you know, follow History Maker Society, click like, share the broadcast so other people can hear this. And you've got, you've got some ideas that are just, some ideas are going through my mind, Joel, about you mentoring some people in some things, mm-hmm. how to get involved in social justice, almost like a History Maker Society social justice arm. And I think I want to yeah. talk to you about that at some point uh, i'd love to i'd love to see what we can do there for people who are who are interested mm-hmm. in getting involved uh i did an article series when trump was running for first term of you know president of the united states and it was uh trump talk from a canadian or with a canadian or something like that mm-hmm. there was an uproar that really surprised me and it seemed to be the same thing I was running into every time was it was almost as if I was being accused uh, because I'm, I'm endorsing someone who's not either a, a Christian or B their brand of Christian uh, Mm -hmm. or even their denomination of Christian or past, you know, issues, flaws, current things that came out of his mouth, which weren't always so wise. And I was vocalizing the fact that, you know, God will choose somebody, sometimes irrespective of whether they're what kind of Christian they are or a Christian at all. And this was really hard for people to wrap their minds around, that God doesn't always choose a pastor to be a president. He chooses somebody who can handle the task at hand. Would you speak to that a bit? Why? Why would God choose President Trump? Did God choose him, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, and, you know, yeah. Listen, in, in my opinion, he absolutely did. Uh, and you got to remember when you're asking who will God use, you got to remember God used a donkey. So <laughs> it's time to quit being impressed with who God's using to speak through. Uh, you know, and and you've also got to remember when you ask the question, "What would Jesus do?" There's always the possibility that this is the day he would go into the temple with a whip that he had fashioned and start beating some people and throwing tables over. You know, so we we've got such a we have such a narrow view of who Jesus is in the West because we've had it too good. It's been, even in these tough times going through COVID and the economy and upheaval, we still got it better than anybody else in the world. And that's not to say we're better than anybody else in the world. It's just easier here than anywhere else in the world. That's Life is bad. easy in, in North America. And, and we've taken it for granted and we've become soft because of that. Listen, God, 
if John the Baptist showed up today, we'd all want to kill him. <clears throat> he would smell. He would be dressed weird. He would be eating weird stuff. He would be talking weird. He would be telling all of us we're a brood of vipers and all kinds of things. If Jesus showed up today, if you took him from 2,000 years ago and dropped him down today anywhere in the world, he would be a, a pretty rough character by the modern standards. And listen, we can't even judge people going back 20 or 30 years. You start judging people 30 years ago on today's standards and nobody survives. Take it back another 1970 years and think about the difference in how people approach life back then. And, and we have come, what we needed in America was someone who wasn't a politician because the politicians are all corrupt. The system is corrupt. I'm not saying that Trump is not corrupt, but he's not corrupt in the political system. He may well be corrupt in the business or the building system in New York. I'm not saying that he's done everything by, by stellar standards because there's no question that he wasn't, uh, that he wasn't an, uh, an overly godly man for most of his life. I think he's had a radical experience with Jesus uh, since he's been in office. Uh, he hasn't learned to tame his tongue. But that's the hardest thing for all of us to tame. Listen, you hang around with me long enough and, and you're going to wish I would tame my tongue sometimes, too. Wow. And I've been wow. a Christian all of my adult life. And so you look at you look at King Cyrus, who's who Trump is being compared to. King Cyrus was not a godly man, according to Israeli and Jewish standards. But he's who God sent to redeem Israel at that time. And and God often works through ungodly people to do godly things. It's 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 just the nature God has there's certain things God wants done. And you know, I you heard Amy Simple McPherson say or Catherine Kuhlman said this. The reason I'm doing this job is a man somewhere refused to do it and God found me. Uh, you know, and and that's in today's society, that's unthinkable. What do you mean? A, a man wouldn't do it so he had to go to a woman. But that was that was an amazing thing in her day. And God is going to get his job done and he's going to use whatever he has to, to do that. And some, listen, does God, does God kill people with tornadoes? No, but does God redeem a tornado that comes through a community and destroys it? Yes, he does. He redeems a community through that. Does God create a virus like COVID? No. Does he allow it to be created? Yes. And what happens with that? God redeems the world through it. God, there's been a slowdown. One of the things that people don't know in North America, the schools have been were out all of last spring, and because of that, the transgender agenda in the in the American schools was stopped because yeah. kids yeah. were suddenly not in school. In in the United Kingdom, they've had a huge outbreak in the last six months of kids detransitioning from this transgender stuff and and going and saying, "Wait, I really am a girl. I really am a boy. I'm not. I'm not." I wasn't born wrong. And they think a lot of the reason that's happened is because these kids weren't in school. That's wow. God redeeming a bad moment wow. and turning it back to good. He's given us a chance to reset life here in some ways. And that's always like God always uses everything for our good, for those who are called according to his purposes and those who love him. You know what, Joel, you really said that well, succinctly understandable. And, uh, you know, that's what people need to hear. And I noticed just now, Claudio Pavo, uh, he's from France. I believe he's in France. Lyon, uh, France, there, totally agree. God needs totally new people, no church indoctrinated people. <laughs> I think that's the wrong kind of church uh, if you've been indoctrinated. But uh, If you're in France, though, that's, that's a lot of what you're seeing because they've been inoculated from Christianity. And there, yeah, there's, a yeah. move, there's, there's good churches in France, but there are not a lot of them. Uh, they're not prevalent like they are in Canada and America and the Philippines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, here you see the taxis, almost all the taxis, jeepneys. It's actually trendy to put, you know, Jesus saves, John 316. Even some of the remote scriptures that people don't usually know by heart are plastered all over the vehicle because they believe in blessing their cars, you know, all of that. Yeah, Joel, right. this is just awesome. I wanna. I know my wife just put up there uh, p33adventures.com. Uh, so if you want to go to the comment section, guys, if you're interested in going to Israel with us, with myself, Joel, History Maker Society, that's August 2021. 
Uh, just look through the comment section. You're going to see the link there. Click there to get more information. Let's go to Israel together. Also, if you yep. just jumped on the broadcast, I'm watching people come in and out, on and off. Just click share. Share the broadcast. Now, Joel, we've got an exciting <laughs> announcement, which I've been mentioning throughout this broadcast, which is the History Makers Experience has gone online September 24th to 26th. You can get more information on that or register by clicking the link in the body of this, the text of this uh, broadcast. I'm so excited about this because it's like 16 hours of you know, cutting edge, world-class training and equipping. We, we call it a destiny doorway where people take this training. They're literally launched into their destiny, calling and purpose with real results. Uh, Joel, give us a little push for this, a genuine one. Why should people take the History Makers uh, online experience? You've seen it. You've traveled with me all over the world. Yeah. You know, why yeah. should people pay the, pay the price, get trained? What does this offer that other equipping systems don't offer? Derek, th what this offers that other systems don't offer is everything. I mean, the reality is this history makers training is such an intense moment in your life that it, it forces you to deal with the reality of God. And, and wow. the thing that I like, one of the things that I like best about it is that it's the, the way it drives is it's driving you not to become a better church member. It's driving you to become a better Christian, to become a better person who's living the faith. And what we've got to do is, is exactly what you've been saying for years. We've got to get beyond the four walls of the church. The church cannot change the culture from inside the building. And it's not enough to go out of the building and draw people back into the building. We've got to go out of the building, meet people there, minister to them there, change them there. And that's, that's part of what you're going to find at a, Chris, at a History Makers training. You're going to find the ability to find what God called you to do. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be sitting in a church or putting on a tie or being in a ministry. It can be down and dirty, working with alcoholics, working with drug addicts, working with troubled kids, working in human trafficking, but and working in entertainment, working in politics, working in government, working in education, all of those things. History Makers Training is where you're going to learn how to reach out in the secular marketplace and bring your faith into that marketplace in the right way. Because it's not about going into the secular marketplace and preaching the word. It's about going into the secular marketplace and being the word and revolutionizing people's lives sometimes without saying a word. Joel, you I are got. just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, you've seen this thing work. It really does work, yes, and it's worth it every does. penny. I mean, we've got to charge something. It's worth a lot more, frankly. You ought to be low. charging more. Yeah, yeah I, we, we're told that all the time, what, what it's valued yeah. at. And we're just trying to get the church, as many of the church, in through those doors, get trained, equipped, and sent, because it's the urgency of the hour. And uh, I've traveled with, with Joel Thornton, different parts of the world. He is who he says he is, and I just have this thing. I don't know if it's prophetic or what, Joel, but you need to be begin to do some mentoring if you're not already in some of the stuff you know and have lived. And as many of you know, we have our History Maker Society cell groups, we have like society groups, which are groups of individuals who are trained, equipped, and, and are targeting a specific sphere of society. And uh, it would be awesome because now, now we're producing online society groups. We have a goal of 12,000 uh, society groups globally. We have a global goal of 100 to raise up 120,000 legitimate history makers. And I'm just seeing something, Joel. I think it's in the spirit that you've got something to pass on to the next generation, not that your time is done, but you've got some mm -hmm. mentoring to do. You've got so much to give. This would be awesome for us to have this discussion. Can you imagine people from all over the place jumping online to meet with you once a week? and to, yeah. uh, to discuss some things and learn from you, ask questions, and then be effective in their sphere, whether it's you know human trafficking, fighting different injustices, whether it's law, whatever it is. I mean, this would be invaluable wisdom you could give. I'm asking you right now, live, is that something you would contemplate, <laughs> pray about, semi-interested in? I've contemplated, I've prayed about it, I'm in. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Welcome to the <laughs> history. <laughs> now you're, you're already yeah, very yeah. much part of the history. I'm, all, I'm all in, brother. I'm I'm always all in. But you know what? There's a there's a reformer's anointing on this broadcast. There's a reformer's anointing on our ministry, and that's mm -hmm. why this was just coming so strong as we were talking here. And and I'm thinking, Lord, am I? Uh, you know, I'm a bit impulsive with these things. I just I just say it. You know, when the anointing is there, and I'm just feeling that. So. Let me follow up with you on that. And guys, if you're watching, if you're interested in something like that, write to us. Let us know. Uh, you want to be part of, you know, Joel Thornton's weekly mentorship in this area. A society group designed just for that. Man, this is so, so cool. Once again, we want to remind you to share the broadcast. We're so glad you've joined us on our weekly Reformers broadcast. We have a very special guest coming up uh, next week and uh, probably as special as you, Joel. Maybe you'd say he's a little more special, but I would say but, he's more uh, special. He's more special, yeah. So we're not let, letting the cat out of the bag yet of who that is, but it's every Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we're just so glad that you have uh, joined us today. So visit our website, historymakersacademy.com. We've also got loads of stuff on my YouTube channel. I got to keep, I got to remember to look up at this, this, this screen here, you know, Joel, I've been preaching all over the place for years, and I never imagined I would be sitting in a room, staring at a camera, you know, preaching in my shorts. What has yeah. happened to the world? This is just amazing. And it'll be hard for me to go back to not preaching in shorts, I think, Joel. So I preach in the shorts. We'll just pretend we're in Bermuda everywhere we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just enjoyed this a little bit. So, so my YouTube channel is Derek Schneider Official. Look, my wife's got it got it running across the bottom there i'm so thankful for my wife joel i know you're it's thankful for your wife job. and are I'm you aware your wife too are, are you aware yeah i bet are you aware that that uh she is pregnant yes you know i that? saw that congratulations oh. well thank and you. it's you're you're in for the the unimaginable joy of a lifetime oh wow i felt that i feel that thank you yeah Joel Thornton, you are the man. Right there, you caught a glimpse of, of the compassion within this reformer. He is a compassionate reformer. He doesn't tear down, he builds up. He builds up even when he's tearing something down. It's really to build up the kingdom of God. Uh, Joel, can they get your books anywhere? Give a quick plug for books, and then we got to go. I, you know, I, my books are not in print right now. If they want a book, they need to email me. I've written a novel they can get from me uh, by emailing me at joel at ihrg.org. And they can get a book that I co-wrote with you off of your website. Is Kingdom Your Purpose? That's right. And that is on Amazon. I, and I didn't even, we didn't compare the link. We're going to do that next time. But His Kingdom Your Purpose on Amazon.com. You can actually order it there. It is there. That's myself with Joel Thornton. Joel, we're so honored that you took the time to be with us. I know your schedule is is busy you've got lots going on you're changing the world what i'm most excited about that that's come out of this broadcast is the idea of a society group that you are mentoring people in the following areas so if you don't mind maybe pick three to five areas that you could mentor people in shoot it over to mm -hmm. me and we can kind of put the word out and we'll, we'll process let's talk by phone okay that sounds good derek i'd love to and hey let me let me tell you this real quickly before we go uh about 10 years ago, I walked into a church in Germany, and the pastor talked to me, uh, gave me a personal prophecy about mentoring people. No way. <laughs> and then I walked back into the church about about seven years ago, and the same pastor gave me the same word with a little bit different of a flavor, but said, I know I told you this before, but God changed what I'm, what I'm seeing you do, but, but he's making you a mentor. You see, that's part of your it's part of your spiritual inheritance is your calling, mm -hmm. purpose, and destiny. And that anointing on this broadcast just unlock that right now. Like yep. how cool is that? This is the 2020. We are gonna look back with 2020 vision, which is hindsight, and we're gonna see all that God did in the midst of crisis. Joel Thornton, thank you so much for being with us. I'll follow up with you later. Uh we'll uh yeah. we'll just wish you blessings and and a great evening. And I uh, just want to see us. Mine, that's a good friend of mine, Mark Randolph Waters. He listens to me on local radio every Friday morning at nine o'clock. Awesome. Hey, Mark, thanks awesome. for joining awesome. us. Thanks, buddy. 
Mark, welcome. Follow the History Maker Society page and share this broadcast if you don't mind. And Joel, we'll let you go. It was great to chat with you. I want to see who's in the chat bar. Let's just go through and uh, take a look. We had Jude from Toronto watching, Eti Jem Galvez from uh, Philippines. Brad Vader's, you're becoming a regular. I'm looking for you on here. Brad Vader's blessing from London, Ontario. Uh, Dabo Davies, different ones. Claudio Pavo, bonjour. I, I, that's, I have some memories with that guy in Ukraine. So great to see you, Mark Randolph, again. Welcome. So this was so awesome. We're going to let everybody go. Blessings to you. Don't forget, September 24th to 26th, the History Makers Experience. A lot can happen in two and a half days. Your life will be transformed, I promise you. Just click the link in the bar above. Uh, in the uh, text, the body of the text there, click it. It'll take you right to more information. There's a splash page with all the details that you need to know. So we love you so much, and let's make history. That's what we do. We make history and make history makers. God bless you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>